Pastor Buzz and David mentioned uh, influences in Christendom that we don't agree with. There's always going to be some of those. Um, and the question is, is, um, is any hill, any particular hill, to use the phrase that's common, a hill to die on? Which things do you dig your heels in and say no? Which things do you let go as acceptable differences between brothers and sisters in the Lord? So today I want to ask, is sola fide, justification by faith alone, a hill to die on? It split the church 500 years ago. We're still split today. Are we making a mistake? Should we find a way to compromise and bring two camps together? They give a little, we give a little. Or is sola fide a hill to die on? Martin Luther would say it is. He said sola fide is the pillar on which the church stands or falls. The Roman Catholic Church convened the council. Uh, it was called the Counter-Reformation, or at least it's known as that now. It began to meet about 30 years after Luther first put his theses on the church door. And they said, yeah, it's a hill to die on, but you're completely wrong about why you should die on it. They said in Canon 12, they, they met together and they wanted to answer all these things that Luther and the other reformers were saying about the gospel and about the church and in Canon 12, they said this. Listen carefully. If anyone shall say that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in the divine mercy, pardoning sins for Christ's sake, or that it is that confidence alone by which we are justified, pause there with me, confidence in divine mercy, that pardons sin for Christ's sake and faith in that justifies. To me, that's the gospel. In Canon 12, it says, if you believe that, let him be accursed. So Luther says it's a hill to die on. The Council of Trent says it's a hill to die on. But in the end, what we're interested in is, does Scripture say whether it's a hill to die on? Galatians 5.4 you have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. James 2.24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now those verses appear to say something very different. We'll try to reconcile them. But what they both say is that something is at stake. I don't want to be severed from Christ. And apparently there are things that I could do that would sever me from Christ. I want to be justified. And so I need to know how that works. Am I justified by faith alone? Or am I justified by faith plus works? Those are the two choices put before us in the Reformation dispute. Luther said faith alone. Trent said faith plus works. And the disagreement continues to this day. This is a hill to die on, and we need to get it right. But as I was preparing this, I really felt a deep concern that this could easily turn into a lecture, easily turn into me giving you a little historical information, say, look at this text, and this guy argued this way, and look at that text, and that guy argued that way, and you would walk out with a little more light, but no more heat. And I'm borrowing Jonathan Edwards' language there. He equates light with understanding, and he equates heat with passion and love and a right response to what you have, in fact, been taught. I want us to learn, but I don't want us to learn so that we're smarter or more grounded or more assured in what we already know. I want us to learn, ultimately, so that we worship. The end of doctrine is worship, not pride and knowledge. So to that end, I just want to remind us before we begin to climb this hill, it's an amazing thing that there's a hill to climb. There's two doors, faith alone, 
faith plus works. Only one door leads to salvation. You ought to be stunned that there's a door. That's the point that I want us to begin from. God doesn't owe us a door. But he's given us a door. We have work to do to make sure we we walk through the right one. But I am amazed that there's a door. And I pray that you are as well. I want to do four things this morning. I want to consider a few texts first that I believe support justification by faith alone. I had eight to begin with, and I said that's way too many. We can't do eight, so I've cut it all the way back to six, um, which is still a substantial number, but we'll move through them very quickly. And uh, they are, in fact, coherent. Most of them are in Romans, um, and I think it will be to our edification But now as we look at them, still on this first thing that we're going to do, as we look at them, it would be easy, and I've seen it happen, to leave the impression that we alone read our Bibles. If only those other people who had wrong doctrine read their Bibles, we wouldn't have these disagreements. And it's easy to become snide, it's easy to become proud, it's easy to be ignorant, even when you're right. I disagree with the Catholic Church. But the Catholic scholars read their Bibles. It's not like I can show up for a bishop or a monsignor or the pope and say, hey, have you read this? And have him say, well, no, I haven't. Where is that in Romans? No, he's read it. He's read it in Greek. He's read it in Latin. He's read it in German. He's read it in English. It isn't ignorance that the text is there. It's a disagreement about what the text means. And so let's not be snide or presumptive that we alone open the scriptures. And therefore, all we have to do is is show somebody a text and the argument is is resolved. It is not that simple. So we're going to look at some texts that support sola fide. Second, we're going to look at texts that challenge sola fide, primarily in James 2, when Trent wanted to to just really repudiate what Martin Luther and the Reformers were teaching, they went to James 2 and said, Martin, you cannot stand in front of this text. And Martin did struggle with it. He so struggled with James that he said, this is an epistle of straw. He wished it would go away. Since then, people have, I think, done good work in reconciling Paul and James, but we do need to look at that. Third thing I want to do today is ask and answer fairly briefly Why does faith justify? Have you ever asked that? What is it about faith that allows God to say, I reckon you as righteous? In the Reformation, it was called the instrument of justification. Well, when I think of an instrument, I think of a a guitar, a piano, a hammer, a chainsaw. What is it that faith does that allows God in perfect righteousness to say, not guilty to the person who exercises faith? And finally, I want to end with a couple of reasons for why I think sola fide, justification by faith alone, is so hard for some to accept outside our tradition, and I'm going to argue even within our tradition, although in a more subtle way, and what can we do about it? It's not good that we're divided over this, but we we agree we must be divided and our reconciliation needs to be based in truth and not just expediency. So let's begin and look at some texts that I believe support sola fide. Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now that's a verse that I wanted to warn us about. You could jump on that verse and say this is dispositive, which means it is so plain, so self-evident, it can only have one meaning, that it disposes of the question. We're justified by faith, apart from works of the law. Paul's clear. Next question. Not so fast. People that don't agree have read that text. And do you know what they do with it? They do something that's interesting. And I will say, in one sense, clever, and I don't mean that in the, in the uh, uh, pejorative way. It, it took some thought. They said, works of the law has a very particular meaning, Paul. When Paul says that phrase, what he normally means is Jewish identity markers. 
So when he says, you're not saved by works of the law, he's saying you're not saved by circumcision. You're not saved by dietary law. You're not saved by keeping the Sabbath. And there's times that Paul is very much concerned that people understand that that is in fact true. And we agree with those things. You're not saved by those things. If that's what he's saying here, then this verse doesn't necessarily establish sola fide because it could mean that Paul is simply saying, look, we believe that you are justified by faith apart from becoming a Jew. You don't need to be circumcised. You don't need to keep dietary laws. You don't need to observe the Sabbath. And he hasn't said a word about the weightier matters of the law. So people that don't believe in sola fide intelligently, sincerely say, look, when you understand what Paul is saying, the door is wide open yet to say justification is by faith plus works and just understand those works are not those Jewish identity markers. They're the weighty matters, love and mercy. Here's the problem with that. It's oversimplified and boiled down, but I think nevertheless helpful. In the first three chapters of Romans, Paul is establishing universal guilt. At the end of the day, he wants, whether you're Jew or Gentile, to know you're a sinner before God. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That, that's his goal. That's where he's trying to get people to realize. And he does that for Jew and Gentile, not by saying, don't trust just in circumcision or dietary laws or that you're descended from Abraham. He does that by saying, you know, you steal. You commit adultery. You don't seek God. You have a deceitful tongue. Your feet are quick to shed blood. Cursing and bitterness comes out of your mouth. You have no fear of God. That's said to Jew and Gentile. That's uh, Romans 2.22 roughly through about 3.18. Just a long list of serious things that have nothing to do with Jewish distinctives. They have to do a sin and rebellion against God. And he says, Jew, Gentile, you're guilty of those things. And so when he writes in 3.28, we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. I don't think there's any evidence that he's equating works of the law with Jewish pride in being Jewish. Rather, he equates works of the law with keeping all the revealed law of God. And God has something to say about lying and about stealing and about adultery and about cursing and about bitterness. And the reason you can't be justified by the laws that govern those things is because you don't keep them. All have sinned, is Paul's point. Just a few verses earlier in Romans, we read Romans 3.19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law, comes the knowledge of sin. Paul wants our mouth closed. But he knows a man's mouth is not closed because he's discovered he can't tithe mint and dill and cumin and keep the Sabbath and eat the right dietary foods. Peter did it. When the, when, when the sheet is lowered before him in Acts and he, with unclean animals, Peter says, I've never eaten those. Paul in, in Philippians 3 says, I kept the law. Jesus turns to some of the Pharisees and he says, you're really good at keeping the law. You tithe mint and dill and cumin. A Jewish mouth would not be shut because it was accused of blowing it with dietary ceremonial type laws. No, the mouth is shut when you realize you don't love God like you should. You don't love your neighbor like you should. Gossip comes out of your mouth. Envy is in your heart. What shuts your mouth is when, not when you say tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin. What shuts your mouth is when the word says thou shalt not covet, and covetousness explodes out of you. And you realize what a rebel you are. And that's exactly what Paul says happens. I, I didn't know what coveting was until God told me not to do it. Every mouth is closed, and all the world is accountable to God because one of the main functions of the law is to confront us with how little we can keep it, how guilty we are, how much our mouth should be closed. 
Therefore, Paul concludes, by works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Because you can't keep it. And by the way, we won't go here, but in Galatians, Paul says, if you want to keep it, make sure you keep it all. And now it's a whole lot less attractive, isn't it? You might be good at one part of it. I promise you, you don't keep it all. So we have the bad news in Romans 3.20. By works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. In 3.28, we have the good news. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And what's in view is the law and not a few Jewish distinctives. Paul continues in Romans 4, and he simply reminds the people, remember Abraham, he says? How was Abraham justified? He says, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. When did that happen? It happened 430 years before the law was given. Well, he was circumcised, right? No. He's reckoned righteous in Romans 15. The covenant of circumcision is given. I'm not Romans 15. Genesis 15. The covenant of circumcision is in Genesis 17. And there are years that separate the two. You have a man without the law, a man without the covenant sign. He believed and he is declared righteous. And that's the example Paul uses. Look what Abraham found. In Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. And all I want us to notice from that are some of the tenses. When did justification happen? Sometime in the past. Look at having been justified is past tense. What's now present tense for Paul? We have peace with God. We stand in grace. Need to get the order right. First comes justification, that declaration that you are reckoned righteous. Then comes peace with God, standing in grace, leading to the hope of the glory of God. There's significance in how that's laid out. Sola fide can talk that way. Justification happens the moment a person puts their faith in Christ, even as they spend a lifetime then learning to walk out the implications of that, learning what it means to have their mind transformed learning what it means to be led by the Spirit, learning what it means to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Justification occurs in a moment. That sanctification, that good works, that learning how to walk it out is a lifetime process. But note, we walk it out as fully justified sons and daughters at peace with God. Paul's not alone in teaching sola fide. Peter, Acts 10, 43 says, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Now it's not fair to Peter to ask him to put the entire gospel in one sentence. And so he won't. But he does say you're going to receive forgiveness of sins and he says the way it's going to happen is that you're going to believe in him. If the correct equation for justification is belief or faith plus works equals justification, then Peter only gave him half the formula. It's not a matter that he didn't get all the gospel into that with every last implication. It's a matter he didn't get the essentials in there. He didn't tell them what they needed to know, unless it is faith alone. He does this more than once. Acts 15, 8, and God who knows the heart, he's talking about Cornelius now and the Gentiles that gathered in his house and he'd been reluctant to go to them. God shows him he ought to go to them. Holy Spirit comes upon them. And it's so evident that they're saved. And he goes back to Jerusalem to report this. And he says, and God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. 
they didn't have five minutes to figure out what works of the law meant. And Peter says their hearts were cleansed by faith. Is Luke recording only half of what Peter said? Is Peter only giving half the gospel, half the formula for justification? No one believes that. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas go to Philippi and they preach. They're arrested, they're beaten, they're thrown in jail. It's one of the most amazing scenes. Beaten men, chained up in a stinking prison at night, and you know what it says. About midnight, they were singing hymns of praise to God. That's just stunning. And a great window into how faith really operates. An earthquake comes, and I know why it came, and so do you. It opens the doors. It releases everyone's chains. They are free to escape. The jailer wakes up. And what happens to a jailer in that time, under Roman law, if a prisoner escapes, is that jailer would die a very slow and painful death. And so when he wakes up and he sees the doors of the jail open, he assumes they've escaped. He takes his sword. He's about to kill himself. And we pick up the story in verse 28. But Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, Do not harm yourself. For we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's, this, is, this is so good. He saw something. He heard something. And he saw it lived out among those people who claimed to be disciples of Christ. And he just realized his guilt and, and, and something in these people. And he says, I got, I got to have it. I want it. What must I do to be saved? And they answer. And you know how he answered. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. And so I would ask the same question. Has Paul once again given half the formula? Has, is, nobody believes that, that Paul or Peter are like used car salesmen. And forgive me if you're a used car salesman. I'm sure you're honest and you disclose everything. But we all are familiar with fine print. And we've all probably found ourselves in a phone contract or something, car, signing something, not having read the fine print. Is this fine print? We're just going to tell you the easy part. We're just going to tell you believe and you'll be saved. And we're not going to tell you, oh, by the way, you must produce good works in order to, to have justification. We're only going to give you half of it. No, Paul doesn't do that. Peter doesn't do that. Luke doesn't record that. Certainly the man had a lot to learn. Baby, baby Christians, he and his family. What's it going to be like now to be a Christian husband, a Christian father, a Christian jailer? Can he keep his job? It's a rough job. I don't know. But I do know this. Before he could be discipled in any of those things, before he could take his first step in good works, he was promised that if he believed in Jesus, he would be saved, and Paul counts him as saved and baptizes him and his family that very night. There's about two dozen places in Acts where Luke simply calls these early Christians believers. Doesn't call them workers. Doesn't call them good deed doers or whatever that would look like in, 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 the, in the less strained type of, of vocabulary. He just says they're believers. Christians are those who believe. Well, that's not a complete defense by any means. It's a, somewhat of an intimidating task to take a 500-year-old dispute and try to give all the reasons for why you think one side is better than the other, but that gives you a taste. Um, I just want you to see, in this, under this first point, that there are so many texts in Scripture that seem to say justification is by faith. And there's no mention of works. And when it is mentioned, it's saying, and it's not by works. The texts are there. We maintain the man, that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. But now secondly, what about James? There are texts that seem to say something else. There are texts that are challenging. As I mentioned, Luther says James is an epistle of straw. 
I wish it would go away. It's not going away. Does James teach that we are saved by faith plus works, which would be contrary to what we seem to be seeing in Paul and contrary to what Luther and the other reformers said? I believe the answer is no. And I think the way you discover for yourself the answer is no by understanding what James is doing. Let's, let's look at the church he's writing to or the churches and what the problems are. He expresses a concern in chapter 1 with people who are hearers but not doers. They look in the mirror of the word and they see something about themselves and then they turn away and forget it. Do you know anybody like that? They struggle with anger, so they read a Christian book on anger, and they're still angry. They hear a sermon on greed, they're still greedy. They read a book on how to be a better spouse, and they don't change at all. James is addressing a church where at least some people claim faith, and he's asking, okay, where's the evidence of that faith? He's concerned with people that cannot bridle their own tongue. Gossip and criticism apparently flow as freely now for some, at least, as they did on the day they first claimed Christ. In chapter 2, he warns of people in the church that are so shallow that they give preferential treatment depending on how a person is dressed. You walk through that door dressed nice, you get a good seat. You walk through that door dressed poorly, please say them back. James says, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Those are the sorts of issues. He says in James 3 or 4, you you bite and you devour one another because you didn't get your way. He's writing to a church. You think Corinth has problems? James is writing to some churches that have some serious issues. And that leads in then to the section in question, which will begin James 2.14. What use is it, my brethren, If someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? Can a faith that cannot bridle the tongue, does not change in response to what they see in the word, shows partiality to people based on income and clothing, can that faith save? Would you want to trade places with that person on the day of judgment? I mean, what could possibly go wrong? They confess Christ. James continues in verse 15. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. What he's saying so clearly is that not everyone who claims to have faith has faith. Saving faith. Because the Bible does talk about more than one kind of faith. We'll see it. Here here there's a a useless faith at the end of verse 16. What use is that? That's, That's a useless faith that you have. Verse 17, it's a dead faith that you have. And he'll go on with other labels for it. Now he knows some people are going to object. So in verse 18 he says, But someone may well say, You have faith. And I have works. James, haven't you read Paul? Not all of us have the same gift. You've got the gift of faith. I've got the gift of works. Let's just be glad that we're in the same body. Show me your faith without the works. I will show you my faith by my works. What a key sentence for the issue before us. I will show you the reality of my faith. That it's not dead that it's not useless, but it's real and living and justifying. And the way you'll know that is you'll see my good works. Works are the evidence that faith is alive and real. This is one of those places where I just say what God has joined together. We tend to use that with marriage only. But God joins other things together. And he joins faith and works together. And good works are the evidence of a living, real faith. James thinks they're going to continue to protest. Someone's going to say, don't judge me. I believe. 
James 2.19, you believe that God is one. That's a good thing to believe, especially in a polytheistic culture. Paul goes through Athens and he can't count all the idols and all the gods. We've got the unknown God. So in that culture to say, no, no, there's one God, that's a good thing to say. It's an essential thing to say. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. There's a demonic faith, an assent to certain facts. I, I, I believe this. You, the Bible says this, and I agree. I, I'm so glad that we sang some of what we sang. Faith looks on Jesus and describes it not as, oh, that, that's a true person, that's a true, no, my soul's reward. Do you realize what you're singing? Demons can't sing that. Demons can have the right doctrine of Christ, and demons oftentimes do have the right doctrine of Christ. When Jesus goes to cast out demons from the garrison demoniac, they correctly preach a pretty good message. We know who you are. You are the Holy One of Israel. Have you come to torment us before the time? I would argue they probably had more knowledge of Christ than the disciples did at that time doesn't do him any good because he is not their soul's reward. James 2.20, are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? There is a faith that has elements of orthodoxy, true things you can say about God, true things you can say about Christ, and yet it is useless to the person and to those who are around him. And in all this, James is just setting an unmistakable trajectory. There's a kind of faith that assents to true doctrine, um, but has no love for that truth, no love for others, D doesn't live any differently. It changes no one. It doesn't change the person who has it. It serves no one. He says, this is the faith of fools. It is a faith of demons. It is a useless faith. And it's in people in the church, because that's who he's writing to. That faith doesn't save because it's dead. It's not real. But there is a real faith, James says, and you can tell it's real because of the impact that it has on the person claiming it. James 2.21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see now that faith was working with his works and as a result of the works, faith was perfected or completed. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And it's that verse, 224, that Trent put before Luther and said, You're not reading this right. But back up with me just a minute to verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled. What do you hear when you hear the word fulfilled? I think you probably hear, well, prophecies. Prophecies are fulfilled. Maybe you hear promise. Promises are fulfilled. And in fact, that is how the word is used overwhelmingly. If you read the early chapters of Matthew's gospel, and this was done to fulfill the scripture. This was done to fulfill the scripture. Well, what's the prophecy or what's the promise here? Well, it says Abraham believed God. Now, God knows that. God's the giver of faith. So there's no question in God's mind that Abraham believes God because God gave him that gift of faith. But is there doubt in someone else's mind? As the world watches him struggle, afraid of what might happen if he claims Sarah as his wife, struggling in different things as he goes through the walk, there's reason to say, mm, maybe, maybe not. Scripture said Abraham believed God. That is fulfilled. That is proven. That is publicly demonstrated when he offers up Isaac. That's what James is saying. We all claim it. Abraham proved it. That's the issue in James. He is deeply concerned with people claiming faith in Jesus and yet he looks at their life and he says, I don't see it. I don't see the word impacting you. I don't see compassion for the poor. I, I, I don't see you 
looking at the person who comes in not as well dressed as someone else. Maybe that person might need a double measure of grace. Has anybody greeted that person today? I don't see that in you, he says. And so I wonder, is your faith real? Is that a faith that will save? And he will conclude this portion of James in 2.26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. And so I would argue, this is very condensed and very short, and I apologize, but I would argue James is not teaching that faith plus works equals justification. He's teaching the same thing Paul taught. Genuine faith justifies and acts in a certain way. The Reformation formula for that is we are justified by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. And we sang that too. Overcome with joy, I sing. Genuine faith sings. It doesn't just assent to certain doctrines. Third question. Why does faith justify at all? I mean, you, you can say faith justifies and faith alone justifies, but, but why? The answer, I think, is fairly straightforward, but I ask it because I think there are people, I've run into them, that mistakenly have faith in their faith. They know that they have faith, and they give very little thought to the object of their faith, and they're focused inward on the fact that they have faith. It is not the quality of faith that saves. It isn't even, in one sense, the presence of faith that saves. It is the object of faith that saves. Christ saves. And in faith, I am united to him. Martin Luther loved to use the analogy of marriage in this, which is a good biblical warrant. When you get married to someone, you exchange things. Your debts become theirs, or their debts become yours, and their savings become yours, or your savings become theirs. You, 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 there's joint property, joint community. It's a great picture of the gospel. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. He got what we had so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We got what he had, and faith hears that, and faith believes that. Faith takes God at his word, that our sins were placed on Christ, the penalty for our sins was borne by him as he died on the cross. We see his resurrection, and we understand that as, as a demonstration that God's wrath is satisfied. That's why death had no hold on him. Faith accepts and welcomes and rejoices that because of this, Sinful people like you and I can be righteous before God. Faith is not a small thing, guys. Faith is God exalting. He is, I'm so glad Pastor Buzz brought up Isaiah 6. I almost had that in my notes. Faith looks at him and says, holy, 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 and it trembles and it covers its face. And that's what the cherubim do. They cover their face, they cover their feet, and they just cry out about the holiness of God as the temple fills with smoke and peals of thunder come down. Faith says, I can't come before that God. Not in my righteousness. On my best day, all my righteousness is as filthy rags, and don't ask me about my worst day. Faith is a God-exalting Christ exalting in Christ alone. He alone possesses the righteousness I need and freely offers it to me. It's a Christ exalting. It's a sin condemning. I can't come before him with one spot or with one blemish and I got 10,000. It's a self-effacing confession that God is right and I am wrong and Christ alone can fix this mess I've made. It is in one sense a wonderful reversal of what happened in the garden when man says God is wrong and I'm right. No, God is right and I am wrong. Faith looks to Christ like a drowning man looks to a life raft. 
He doesn't look at it and make a series of true statements about it. Oh, that's a raft. It's yellow. It's about eight feet long. It looks like it floats. It's not how a drowning man looks at a life raft. A drowning man gets in the raft and is so grateful it exists. He is not ambivalent. He is rejoicing. And even giving that, the analogy is so imperfect. You want a more accurate one? Let's start with a man dead on the bottom of the ocean. Okay? Let's put him there for three days like Lazarus. He's dead. And the call goes forth, float. Lazarus, arise. And he pops to the surface and he's coughing up seawater. And there's the raft. Isn't it nice there's a raft there? I'm going to study that raft. I'm going to say true things about that raft. No, you get in the raft. In faith, we cling to Christ. In faith, we honor him. In faith, we agree with God that we do not possess the righteousness we need, but he does. Faith justifies a sinner because it unites us to the one who is sinless, whose righteousness alone God will accept. Fourth, finally, I said I wanted to talk about things we might do, talk a little bit about, about why sola fide is hard for some to accept and what we might do to maybe help that along and make it easier. It's been 500 years. Why can't we settle our differences? I'm going to give you two reasons as we close. One, the doctrine of justification by faith alone has been known to produce a significant number of people who profess faith but give no evidence of faith. That's why James writes the way he does. It's why Paul says, because of you, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles all day long. People that claim, I'm God's, I'm God's, we're his people. And then they rob temples, violate another man's wife, dishonest in business, uncharitable to the poor. It's a valid concern for those who reject sola fide. No shortage of people who claim, I'm a Christian. I believe I belong to a church. I'm justified by faith. And then they go out into the world with a consistently terrible testimony. Not the occasional slip up. Not a stumble and, and repentance and apology, contrition and getting up and continuing on, but just not changed at all by the word. Sola fide, standing apart from other essential doctrines, can produce that. It can produce that, shall we sin that grace may abound attitude, to which the answer is no, and they don't hear the no. It can produce people with dead faith. But the answer to this is not the abandonment of sola fide, but the recovery of what biblical faith is. We have been our own worst enemy in this, guys. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, and a man finds it, and he covers it up, and he goes and with joy sells all that he has so he can have that field. And we have reduced it to a confession of some true statements that a demon could make. True faith looks at Christ and says, that's my soul's reward. That's my treasure. That's my hope. And you don't have that, but you preach sola fide, you end up in James with dead faith. And people are right to care about that. And so people have some hesitations about this doctrine because they've seen what it's produced in Protestant churches. Nominal believers who don't seem to be influenced in the least by the gospel they profess to believe. Saving faith, living faith, loves and serves and rejoices and weeps and feels and sacrifices and gives and learns and dies to self. We are justified by faith alone, but how we need to press home in our own house, how we are not justified by faith that is alone. 
True faith produces glorious, wonderful, loving works. Let's be that city on a hill. Let's be that lamp that's put on a lampstand and not under a bushel so that when men see it and see our good works, they give glory to God who is in heaven and say, if that's what sola fide produces, maybe we need to look at it afresh. So that's one thing we can do and one reason why it's a little hard to accept for some. They've seen bad fruit and we own that. There's a second reason it's hard, and this is just universal. This has to do with the human heart, and with this I close. The human heart hates pure grace. We like grace. We don't like pure grace. We like to contribute. We, we don't mind hearing that we're wounded. We don't like hearing that we're dead. To truly accept that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, apart from any good works that we may do now or in the future is to put an end to all human boasting and it leads to the glory of God alone. These solas are tied together. We love to boast. The Bible makes it clear. We love our supposed merit and we push back at a very deep place against any doctrine that says we have no merit. I want to just close with an illustration of that not from the Bible, it's from our life. And see if you don't resonate with this and if you don't recognize yourself in this. We've all been out to a meal, to a restaurant with some friends, six, seven of us. And when the check comes, somebody grabs it and says, I've got it. Now, you know what happens. You came prepared to pay for yourself, as did everybody else. You go, no, 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 don't. And, you, and you reach in your pocket. You, you can cover your own debt. You can pay your own bill, and, and you can in that circumstance. Why do we resist that? Well, we resist it. We're a little uncomfortable receiving charity, a little uncomfortable receiving grace. Now, some of you say, I'm not uncomfortable at all. Let's go to lunch. <laughs> but you know what happens. There's an argument. Ah, oh, you don't have to get that. Well, the person with the check generally wins. They get it. They cover it. You know what happens next? Let me get the tip. You've all been there. Let me get the tip. Why do we do that? Because we are so uncomfortable with pure grace. Even though in that instance, yes, we can cover ourselves. We can cover the tip. The, the very notion of just receiving, just receiving from someone else's generosity and you don't even get to leave the tip strikes very deep in our heart at a place we don't like. And it spills over into our doctrine. That exact scenario happened at a breakfast I was at a few years back. A brother snuck away. We figured he went to the bathroom. He didn't go to the bathroom. He went and found the, the uh, waiter and said, let me cover the bill. So he takes care of it, none of us know about it. He comes back, and we finish our conversation, we finish our breakfast, and we're getting ready to go, and somebody says, we need the check. And this brother says, it's covered. And we went through the process I just described. Oh, no, you don't have to do that. And we all tried to give him $10. I think it was a breakfast. It was a breakfast. And uh, no, no, I got it. Let us leave the tip. I got the tip. We argued. We were good friends, but we argued a little bit and said, oh, come on, no, don't, don't do that. Finally, one brother, and I believe very much in this instance, was led by the Holy Spirit to say this, said, it is finished. And everybody got it. It's finished. It's paid. It's done. And we quit arguing. One of the brothers started laughing with joy because he got it. We had just witnessed a very foundational gospel truth. We don't like pure grace. But he says that's all you're going to get. It is finished. Justification by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone is pure mercy. It puts an end to boasting, and that's why it's to the glory of God alone it's easy to state the doctrine, but it can be hard to walk it out and not to go to God 
wanting to leave the tip. Sola fide says you can't. It is finished. Let's pray. Father God, don't don't let us do what James says so many do. We hear scriptures. We hear gospel. We have a mirror placed in front of us that shows us something of our heart and our struggles and what's necessary and what's real, and we turn away and we forget. Don't let that be so, Lord. What a gracious offer. Justification by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. This is what the authoritative scriptures, which alone have sovereign rule over our lives, this is what they say. Father God, let us embrace that. Let us see Christ as our soul's reward. Receive him, rejoice in him, and we won't have a dead faith. And there'll be no thought of contributing to our justification because we will see that it is in fact finished. And it will not chafe against us. We will break out in laughter and joy. It is so good. You have given us a gospel unlike any other. Let us not improve it. Let us not modify it. Let us not deny it. Let us humbly accept it. It is the best news in the world. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.